Well, good morning. My name is Mark. I am one of the pastors here. It's great to be with you today. That is a new series kicking off next week called New Beginnings. Uh, in fact, you're going to get invite cards as you leave. I'd encourage you to invite someone to that. I'm excited. It's going to really, it's going to talk about purpose. It's going to talk about letting go of the past, those kind of things. Uh, it's a perfect ser- series, in my view, uh, for September. Uh, in fact, we are wrapping up then this series called This Is My Story. So at the Uh, Over the past four weeks, you've heard four different communicators share their story, and uh, today is mine. So I need some participation here. I'm going to ask some questions. Just throw a hand up if this uh, question, if the answer to this question fits you. Raise your hand if you are a Ohio State Buckeye fan. Any Buckeye fans? Okay. All right, put them down, put them down. You can't boo in church this next question. Raise your hand if you're a Wolverine fan. Any Michigan? Okay. So I know, hey, I told you. Okay. So I... (laughs) I got some, I know who my people with courage are, okay? So I saw some of you back. Raise your hand if you are a Penn State fan. All right, I'll get to that in a second, okay? There should be more hands for that. Um, (laughs) Raise your hand if you like red, if your favorite color is red. Raise your hand if your favorite color is blue. Raise your hand if your favorite color is purple. Raise your hand if your favorite season of the year is fall, okay? Raise your hand if your favorite season of the year is winter. Raise your hand if you... That's it, okay. I could go on forever, right? I could, I mean, we could spend the next, this is the sermon today, is just asking you questions for 30 minutes straight, okay. Here's what I discovered by asking you seven or eight questions. The first thing I discovered is there's not enough Penn State fans here, and I need to work on that. I'm from Pennsylvania, so I already have my tickets to the game, Penn State, Ohio State game, so it will, it will go as always. Uh, Penn State will be winning till about three minutes left in the game, and then you guys will beat us, so, but not this year, okay? Uh, the other thing I realized is that, man, we are different. Wow. I only asked like seven or eight questions, and I saw a lot of different hands come up, hands go down. But as I reflect on that, we all are different, right? I mean, we have different likes, we have different dislikes, we have different uh, passions, we have different abilities, we have different families, we have different upbringings, we have different dreams, Right? I mean, there's a lot of things that make a group like this or those watching us online right now different. I think we could all agree. But did you know there is actually something all of us have in common? The thing all of us have in common is we all have a story. I don't know everyone's story. I don't know everyone's name even yet. But I know that we all have a story. It's just something inherent with being human. We have a story. You might have a story with a lot of triumphs. You might have a story that has a lot of tragedies. You might have a story that is just starting, and you might have a story that's been going for a while. You might have a story of new beginnings. You might have a story of, well, nothing's really changed a lot recently. You might have a story right now of your life of incredibly awesome things happening. The story of your life right now might be that it's a really hard season. I tell the staff all the time at our, all our different locations, we are in the people business here at the Valley Church. We do a lot of things. There's a lot of things going on. But at the beginning of the day, at the middle of the day, at the end of the day, we are in the people business. I want people to learn names. I want staff to learn names. I, want, I, want, I don't want people, I, I, I used to tell our, the, our Troy location, I want to be like cheers around here. That would get your attention. And what, what do you think I'm going to tagline? Where everybody, what? knows your name. Now, we're not going to, if you don't want us to know your name, then we won't badger you. <laughs> but, but I'm just like, you matter. That's my point. You matter. You matter to me. You matter to us because you have a story. Everyone that walked in here today, everyone watching this online, wherever you are right now, anyone who's listening to the podcast a month from now has a story. So today I'm going to share my story. I'm going to share my story in a unique way. I'm going to share my story of how God intersected into my life at different seasons of my life as I heard from him and as I responded. But I'm going to also tell it in a way where I want my story to potentially become your story. Now, it's going to look different because it is my story, but it can look the same in different ways. And as we unpack that today, you might see what I'm talking about. A couple weeks ago, my wife uh, had to go out of town Uh, pretty quick, and so we have a nine and seven-year-old, so I was on weekend duty. Uh, School started Wednesday, by the way, in Troy, where I live. Uh, Yes, 
Wednesday, last Wednesday, it was awesome, okay? Um, but weekends, there is no school. So we had a pretty good weekend. We do, when, I'm, when my wife's gone, the menu for meals dramatically changes uh, to their favor, in their view. Wendy's, uh, no, I don't work for Wendy's or spokesman for them, but they had to buy one, get one for a dollar. So we definitely hit up Nuggets and Frosties at Wendy. We went to... Um, Oh, just a tropical cafe, that was, you know, and then we went to Big Boy, uh, which was a highlight. My daughter, our seven-year-old daughter, she calls it Big Bigfoot. Um, <laughs> she's also asked me before if I look like Bigfoot. I don't know what, I don't know if that's a compliment because I'm bigger or I don't know. Okay. So we were having a good weekend. They were, it was good. We were having a lot of fun. We were doing pretty much what they wanted to do, which is, makes life easier on me, right? And so, uh, but there came that point. There came that point around 7 o'clock or so on Saturday, and us, any of you parents, grandparents, you can relate when you just need a break, and there's no one there to, to tag team, you know, there's no baton handoff that weekend, so I did what, you know, a parent should do. I told him, I don't really want to see your face for a little bit, okay? <laughs> I love you guys, but it's been nonstop questions, it's been nonstop needing this, needing that, bickering, you know how it goes. And uh, I said, you know, Dad, I'm just going to go into the room, my bedroom. I'm going to shut the door. If I have to, I'll lock it. And don't be, going to, don't be going to get the butter knife to unlock the door, which has happened. And I said, I just need a little bit of time. It might be, I didn't say it, it might be 10 minutes, it might be an hour. I don't know. It might be the rest of the night. Figure it out. You know where your beds are? <laughs> but I was like, I just, I don't want to hear from you. Right? I just, I, just, I just need a moment when I love you, but I just, I don't want to hear from you. Please don't bother me. Please don't come talk to me. Just figure out what you guys got to figure out. You know what? God's never done that to me, though. God is never, the, my heavenly Father, he has never looked at me and said, Mark, you're annoying me. And I've given him a lot of reasons to say that. He's never said to me, Mark, I am so frustrated with you. I am so upset with you. I am so angry with you. And I've given him a lot of reasons to say that. He's never said, don't talk to me. And he's never stopped talking to me. Now, it doesn't happen all the time. It's not nonstop. And I want to disclaim this on the beginning. I'm in the process, like a lot of us, of learning to hear his voice and learning to hear it better. I'm in the process, maybe like some of you, where I've definitely known he's asked me to do something and I've just flat out disobeyed. Just be straight up. Flat out, it was going to get me too uncomfortable. I didn't want this nudge of going to talk to someone about my faith you know, or whatever it might be where I've just flat out disobeyed. So I don't want you to leave here today thinking, man, this guy just like gets it all right. In fact, if, if you think that, I'm preaching here again next week. I'll bring my wife and she can explain my flaws. She might enjoy that actually. I don't know. Um, but this is my story of God intersecting in my life. But I want to look at a passage of scripture that talks about, about, about God speaking. I'm going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, I always love, just if you're on your phone, grab the Bible on your phone. I'm going to be in what's called the New International Version or the NIV. Uh, their Bibles should be at your seats. Um, it's 1 Kings. We're going to be at 1 Kings. I'm not sure what page number it is, but you could, it's towards the beginning. Just keep leafing from the beginning. If you want to read it on the screen, that's fine too. Here's the deal. I'm going to be in Kings 19, and I'm going to start in verse 11. I'm going to give you a little synopsis of, of chapter 18. I'm kind of one of those preachers, or I, I don't really care if you read chapter 18 while I'm preaching. In fact, it's probably, it might be better than the sermon anyhow. So, uh, but this, if, if this, how you hear from God and how you respond, go for it. The setting for this is there's a prophet, his name's Elijah. Chapter 18 tells us that he had one of the most monumental victories ever in his spiritual life. There were the prophets of Baal, a foreign god that a lot of people were worshiping, and there was uh, uh, Elijah, who said, I'm the prophet of the only true God. And essentially, they call a contest. Let's bring it on. It was, it was you know, octagon style back in the first, you know, back in pre-first century. And say, we're going to bring it, and we're going to bring it, and if, if this happens, then the prophets of Baal, Baal's the one true God, and if, if the Yahweh, the real God, shows up, then he's, and you can read it for yourself, 
but God shows up and he just rocks. He dominates, and it's crystal clear. An incredible spiritual victory for Elisha. Elijah, an incredible spiritual victory, incredible moment. And like that, and this happened to me too, but like that in verse 19, or excuse me, chapter 19, verse 1, this lady Jezebel, who was always up to no good, comes to Elijah and essentially says, I'm going to take you down. And you would think, oh, he's going to, you know, he's like, no, God just showed up in an incredible way. I'm not going to, this lady's not going to have anything on me. But we see he actually goes into a depression like that. How do I know he went into depression? Because he literally is asking God, God, would you take my life from me? Would you just get rid of me? Would you end it now? And he runs off. He runs off and his tail's between his legs, you know, so to speak. And he has to be, he has to be in this moment of confusion, of, of seeking, God, don't turn your back on me. God, I, I know I failed. God, I know I've messed up. And he's, he's just in this really hard spot. I've been there. And here's what happens. It's recorded in verse 11 of chapter 19. Then the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. Notice what it said. The Lord said. The Lord spoke. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was what? Not in the fire. And after the fire came, this is so cool, after the fire came a what? Gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went down and he stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice, what? Said, key word, voice said, a voice spoke to him. Every word in the Bible matters. I love to just stop and try to read it slow. I read it too fast, too often. Then he said, a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. In one word, this guy is desperate. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Notice again, the Lord what? Said to him. God is not distant. He is not foreign. He is not aloof. He is not like, I hope hope you have an above average life. Good luck with it. He is crazy about us. I tell people all the time, especially when I find out I'm a pastor, which I try to avoid because people act weird when they find out you're a pastor. I'm like, you just use that word earlier, you know, whatever, it's not offending me, whatever, okay? I always tell them, I'm not into religion. That gets their attention. I said, I'm into a relationship. I'm not into religion. Religion seems very distant. It seems very abstract. It seems very aloof. I'm into a relationship because he speaks. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. He gave him direction. Go to the desert Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram. He gave very specific guidance. He is not going to leave you in the dark. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah to succeed you as a prophet. God speaks. In fact, God so desperately wants to speak to you and me. Did you know that he wants to speak to you? Did you know that he wants to, this life that you're living and you're just going along, he wants to intersect in it. He wants to come, and he wants to meet, and he wants to see the trajectory of your life change. So I want to ask you a couple questions. Anytime I speak, I think, I think questions are what we should do when we're teaching. I think questions cause us to reflect, if you allow them to. I think questions cause us to think a little bit. My first question is this, when's the last time that you know that God spoke to you about something? It's a simple question. When's the last time you know that God spoke to you? Now, I'll get to your objections later. Objections was, how do I know he speaks? What does he sound like? How do I know? I'll get that. So I'm not going to leave you hanging. That would be uncool. But when's the last time? Sometimes I'll talk to people and they've been, they've been coming to church every week for, for 50 years and, and I'll be like, 
I'll ask that question. So what's God saying to you? And they'll tell me about a story from 20 years ago that they knew God said to, to take this new job. And I'm like, that is awesome. That is so cool. And then I'll be like, that was 20 years ago. Like, it's a relationship. Like, he's not on a 20-year nap. He's not watching endless, nonstop reruns of ESPN. Like, he is alive. He is active. He is speaking. So when's the last time you know that God nudged you with something? That's the first. The second is this. Now, you can't answer this question too soon. You're going to want, some of you are going to want to answer this question immediately. This is like, you know, like, who's the best person in the world? Like, Jesus, right? Yeah. This, you're going to be tempted to answer this. Here's the question. Do you really want God to guide you? And you see, I told you, some of you are like, yeah. No, 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 no. Do you really, do I really want God to guide me? I can say yes, because that sounds like that's the church answer, right? That sounds like, but what if he asked me to do something that isn't in my plans? Uh-oh, <laughs> right? So I want you to hold on to that question. Do you really want God to guide you? I was in seventh, it was the summer before my eighth grade year. I just come out of seventh grade. I'm at a summer camp in Cape May, New Jersey. My grandparents lived on a camp, church campground uh, and they would have camp meeting. Uh, and back in the day, then there was this building on the campground, on church camp, con, campground called the Tabernacle. The word tabernacle best translates in the, from the Hebrew into English as a building without air conditioning. <laughs> and you spend time there in the summer when it's nasty hot. It's a week of camp meeting, the revival, if you will. That morning, I know that I know. God doesn't speak to me in an audible voice. I've never heard like an actual voice. I know some have, and that's awesome. I have never had that happen. But I had this sense, I had this nudge that, I, that was essentially saying to me, you know a lot about Jesus, but you don't know him. You've been to church many times. You're there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You're what, yeah, but you don't know him. Tonight is the night that you're going to walk. And this, this is my story. It, doesn't have to, it can look different for you. But he said, this is the night when they make the call to come forward. You're going to come forward and you're going to pray and you're going to ask God to become the leader of your life. So that, Sunday, that, that service that night, I sat in the second row because I was not going to walk far. <laughs> I sat in the second I don't remember a word that the preacher pray, or spoke that night, which is always humbling, since that's what I do. And I know they were going to sing, and I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but that was back in the day, they would sing that song 10 or 12 times, right? I mean, they're going to bring that chorus back and back, right? The first word, I essentially was bolting up there. I'm not a guy who wears his emotions on his sleeve, uh, but that night, I, at that altar, I could not stop crying because I knew that I knew in that moment, I'll, I'll never forget it, is when I gave my life to Jesus. Now, I told you I'm going to tell my story in a way that maybe can become your story. So my question is, have you ever given your life to Jesus? Do you just know about him or do you know him? Have you ever had that moment when you don't even know what it is, but your palms get sweaty, your heart starts beating faster, and you, when, they're, when they're talking about giving your life to Jesus, but you're like, ah, I'm not ready. Or, man, what am I going to lose? Or what am I going to give up? And I'm going to give you a chance before we leave today that maybe that part of my story can become your story. That you can cross, the Bible says, crossing from darkness into light. Crossing from non-life into life. Crossing from being broken into being made whole, or the process of being made whole. I was a senior. Next time I felt, I heard God's voice. I told, I told you, there's no way God didn't speak to me for five years. But I was doing my thing and all that kind of stuff. But I was a senior. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have some athletic opportunities. I wanted, and, and some of them were schools, you know, that if I said the names, you would know. And and it was this, in uh, November, and my mom said, hey, why don't we go check out this school called Mount Vernon Nazarene University? My uncle's a professor. They had been recruiting me some for baseball for a couple years. And I'm like, uh, not really, because that's not going to get my name on the front page. That's going to not get my name above the fold. But I went that night, or I went that weekend. My uncle had some, friend, some students over. That night, after hanging out with them, I couldn't get to sleep. I knew 
that I knew that I knew that's where God wanted me to go. And how did I know? Here's one way you know it's God's voice. If you start really having serious arguments with yourself about the direction of your life, that's an indicator that it might be God speaking and not your own thoughts. Because I'm like, God, that's not this Big Ten score or this ACC score or whatever. This is like, no, one, no one's going to know. I'm not going to be, it's not going to, no one, maybe a little blip in the paper. I did obey. God speaks. And so what I want to turn that back to you today is, is there some area of your life where you're seeking direction? How, or better yet, have you even asked God where you're supposed to go to college? Have you even asked God what, what career you're supposed to have? Have you even asked God what the next season of your life looks like? Retirees. Have you asked God what this chapter of your life, what you're supposed to do? So often, we can come here every Sunday, we can read the Bible, we can sing the songs, we can even pray, but we do, I don't know if you're like me, but I do a lot of talking when I pray and not as not listening. The old one, two, right? Listen twice as much as you talk. Have you consulted God about your future? I'm just asking. Because I said earlier, because a lot of, I did see a head, some heads go up and down when I said, do you want God to guide you? Well, part of him guiding us is, the Bible tells us that we can determine the path, but God will direct the steps. It's okay to have dreams, I have them. It's okay to have ambition, I have them. It's okay to have goals, you, I think, I don't know how you live without them, frankly. But will you hold them loosely? And here's the kicker, here's what I love about that passage. Will you and I slow down enough to hear his still, small voice. I think the biggest reason you and I miss his voice is because we go at the speed of light. We're, the margins are here and we're out here somewhere and we're just going and we're going and we're going and we come here and maybe we still ourselves for a little bit, which I, that's why I think this is so important, by the way. We still ourselves for a little bit. And I'm just telling you, as someone, I was a teacher for a decade, so I sat where you are for a long time. There's been, there was so many moments of my life there in, in a service like this, God nudged me about something. What's he nudging you about today? Is there somewhere where you're just desperate for direction and guidance? <clears throat> I was telling someone between services, God is not up there just trying to mess with our heads. Sometimes we think that, right? He just, he's, he's just trying to just mess with me. I'm just going to take this step and it's going to be the wrong step and I'm gonna, it's going to mess up my life or whatever. That is a terrible theology. Will he unpack everything for us? No, because you and I can't handle that. In fact, if he did, then what would happen? We wouldn't go to him. We'd just live even more independent. But he will guide and direct you. He will show you. And sometimes he just says, take that step. You know, the Jordan River didn't part until they stepped in it. The Red Sea parted before they went in. Have you ever noticed the Jordan had to take a step in it? Then God showed up and started course correcting I was in my mid-20s, um, and I don't know why, but maybe you've experienced this, but Satan just kept throwing something from my past back at me. You don't have to shake your head or raise your hand on this one, but you ever have that happen when you know you're forgiven, you know you've been set free, you know whatever, but, you know, and God, God, hits, God plays with the erase button. When we, he tells us he forgives our sins as far as the east is from the west. If, he is faithful and if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Satan works on rewind and then play. God works on delete. Satan works on rewind and play. And you might know you've been forgiven. You might know you've been set free. But then he'll bring it back. And I was going through that season for a little bit. Where you don't sleep as well. You kind of, the guilt and whatever, you know. One night, I'm just, this is so cool about God, the still quiet. One night, I'm just, I'm laying on the couch watching baseball, which is a sacred holy moment, by the way. That's my sarcasm. You'll, deal, you'll learn that. In that moment, God brought to mind Philippians. Paul said in Philippians, forgetting what is in the past, or forgetting the past, and straining for what is ahead, I press on to reach the goal of which I've been called heavenward. In that moment, peace. You ever have this? It's the coolest, one of the coolest things in the world. That peace from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. 
And I knew that I knew that the creator of the universe, the one who has like six or seven billion people and all kinds of responsibilities, met me in that living room at eight o'clock watching a Phillies game. And, and, and he knew what I was battling. He knew what I was struggling with. And he wanted to speak to me, a still, quiet voice. I just want to ask you today, did you bring something in today? Did you bring something in that you just, you keep beating yourself up about or you just whatever? I'm just telling you, if you've given your life to Christ, then that is forgiven, it is healed, it is set free, the chains are broken, and Satan, he's the deceiver, he is the one who just wants to keep bringing it back. Maybe today's the day that you hear that still quiet voice of saying, it's time to let it go. Maybe today's that still quiet voice of saying, it's time to go and give it to Jesus. To be healed and be set free. I was in Haiti in 2011, one year after the earthquake, no, 2012, so one year after the earthquake, I was in Haiti, somewhere in that frame. I was in an orphanage. I had a baby hanging on my leg. I had a toddler in my arms. And this was, this is when, again, things that you just don't come up with in your own head is one way you know God's speaking. I felt this nudge that I was supposed to adopt. Like, where in the world did that come from? Like, you ever have that? Where in the world did that thought come from? Uh, you know, was this my own thoughts or was this some bad fast food from last night? You know, I'm like, what, what, what is going on here? I'm a single guy. And I had in my mind, again, you deter, you can, I think we all project kind of our future, right? I was like, I'm going to have a wife. I'm going to have two kids, 2.4 kids, you know, whatever the average is. I'm going to have a white picket fence. My kids are going to look like me. Fast forward, I meet this gal in the course of getting to know each other. I, I don't even know if we talked about when we were dating. But at some point in our mar- either late in dating, engagement, or marriage, we had a conversation about kids, and I shared that story, and she shared, well, because she hears God so much better than I do, at the, in seventh grade, she felt God call her to adopt. Five years ago, during this time, actually, we were in Colombia, Bogota, adopting our, our current nine- and seven-year-old. You never know what God wants to reveal if you say, God, I'm open-handed. In fact, I think that's why you and I have to put ourselves out. If I had never gone there, I don't, maybe it would have worked, I don't know. That's why I'm huge on mission trips. Like, I think everyone should go to Honduras at some point. Now you're like, heck no, I'm not going to Honduras because I might be called to adopt. I'm not going to, <laughs> like, you're like, Mark, you have a terrible sales pitch for Honduras, okay? When we do those things, Yes, we are ministering and making a difference in the lives of others, but what we have done is we've put ourselves out of our context. We've put ourselves, in that case, even out of our culture. We've put ourselves in a, we've, we've kind of positioned ourselves, frankly, to be available, haven't we? Those have gone on those trips, right? You, when you do that, you position yourself to be available, and when you're available, guess what happens? You start hearing the still, small voice. A couple years ago, uh, our Troy campus was expanding, and we were moving from a portable location to a permanent. And with that, obviously, it entailed raising, you know, uh, financial um, raising money. Jess and I, my wife and I, have always believed that uh, this guy in the Bible who talked about the Old Testament. There's a guy in the Bible that shows up in the New Testament, but he said about the Old Testament that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but he actually came to fulfill them. Now, the law and prophets is what we call the Old Testament. Now, there wasn't a New Testament, so that was what the Old Testament was called. His name was Jesus, by the way. And so I'm one of those, and maybe I'm becoming the uh, minority as pastors that maybe these days, that believes that the Old Testament works with the New Testament. And because Jesus said he didn't come to get rid of it, he actually came to fulfill it. Then what happens in that Old Testament still matters today in many ways. There are certain things that are contextual or culturalized, but some of the, the truth doesn't change. Malachi talks about, even goes back to the book of Genesis, that the first 10% is his. The t- first 10% of our money is his. Jess and I live by that principle. It's called tithe. In fact, in Malachi, God says, you're robbing him. If you don't give it to him, he says, return it to me. Return it. Not, you're not giving it. You're actually returning it. You're returning it because it was already his to begin with. But then there's times when he asks us to give above and beyond. And Jess and I have just learned this in our life. We just start praying. We start praying and say, God, what do you have us to do? Now, again, I'm, I, I told you earlier, I've disobeyed enough times. I've not listened enough times. I've, I've just made decisions on my own. So, again, I don't want you to hear that I got this all figured out. But this time, a couple years ago, we prayed. And both of us got this sense that we were supposed to give 25% above and beyond. I've had God mess with me on that a few times in life. And here's what I usually say back to him. Hey, God, um, 
I know you're all knowing. I, I do believe you're all knowing. But I'm going to give you my username and password to my bank account, God. Because apparently you're looking at the wrong one right now. So I just want you to see, I do. We've had, God and I have had this conversation. Three years later, that, that's over. We were obedient in that. And here's what I've learned. God will speak to us and he will stretch us in ways, wow, that we would never do on our own, but it will change the trajectory of our relationship with him. Here's my bottom line today. Every day, you and I hear all kinds of voices, don't we? I mean, think about it. In a given day, how many voices, I mean, you have your own self-talk, you have voices from your spouse if you're married, you have voices from your friends, from coworkers, from 17,000 different social media influencers, different podcasts, different books you read, right? Every day, we have all kinds of voices that speak to us. And I'm here to tell you, church, it's the voice that you and I follow that will determine the trajectory of our life. Whatever, I'm just, this is a straight up, whether you're, you believe in God, don't believe in God, think I'm just nuts or, or you, you're following after, I'm just telling you as a fact, no matter what you believe about scripture, whatever voice you follow will determine where you go. That's just a fact. You really can't totally argue with me on that, I don't think. Whatever voice you and I listen to, that's what we're going to follow. Am I, I don't think I'm off my rocker on that one, right? I mean, that's just, a, that's just a blanket statement. It's a cause and effect. If you listen to this voice and follow it, you will go. You see where I'm maybe going with this? The only voice you and I should listen to that matters at the nth degree is God's voice. Yes, your spouse. I'm not saying don't listen to your spouse. And I'm not saying don't listen to well-meaning friends. I'm not even saying don't listen to podcasts. I listen to all kinds of podcasts. I, I read all kinds of books. I, but at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, it's the voice of God. It's that still, small voice, that voice of conviction, that voice of direction, that voice of truth, that voice of stretching. And how do you hear it? You guys spend time with them. I'd be like you saying, well, I'm in a relationship with my wife. Well, when's the last time you talked to her? About well, 10 years ago. How's that going for you? <laughs> right? I mean, it's silly, right? If we say we're in relationship with him, but we don't talk to him, if we say we're in relationship with him, but we don't hear from him, what kind of relationship is that? This is how people ask, well, how do I hear his voice? It's like anything, you got to want to. And you got to spend time with him. This, God was not aloof. He was not distant. He is not trying to just have you play a guessing game. He revealed himself. There's no question, there's no scratch. I wonder how God, what his character is. There's no question on what his promise is. He revealed it from the beginning to the end. And actually, even in Genesis, he was speaking to them in the Garden of Eden. And in Revelation 22, he says, behold, those who come and knock at my door, I will let in. He speaks through all scripture. He speaks in all kinds of different ways. He spoke through a finger writing on the wall. He th spoke through prophets. He spoke through a donkey. I mean, he speaks in all kinds of different ways, but the best way is through his word. They didn't even have all that. We do. Here's a prayer I pray. It's a simple prayer. I close my eyes. I say, God, would you, and then I fill in whatever. I, God, would you give me direction on this decision of the church? God, would you speak truth into my life about this situation? Then I just say, God, and I, I want to hear. I want to hear your voice. So, God, would you silence the voice of the enemy? God, would you silence the voice in my head? And God, would you just speak to me? And I say, Amen, which means actually, and let it be, and let it be so. Now I'm a instant guy, and so I pray that prayer. Dear God, would you give me direction on the Valley Church right now? And I want to hear your voice. I don't want to hear my own. I don't want to hear the enemy. God, would you give me direction? In Jesus' name, amen. Anyone else around here? I'm like, okay, it's been 10 seconds, God. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I, I, here's what I've learned. Number one, he's out of, write it down. This is so fun, by the way. Write down your prayers. Write down the things you're seeking. Write down what you want to hear from him. I'll go back to that sometimes months, sometimes, sometimes I've forgotten that prayer, but it really meant a lot at the moment. And then I see when I look at my journal, I'm like, my goodness, 
He didn't forget. He actually answered that prayer two weeks ago. He's so good. If you want it, he's already speaking. Close with this. Dr. Bill Bright, um, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, was being interviewed by this guy. This guy actually went around and he interviewed all these Christian leaders. And this interview that day, as he, as he tell, retells the story, was with Dr. Bright. Dr. Bright, was a, he's passed away since, but he was a big, burly man. He said, I walked into Dr. Bright's office, and there sat Dr. Bright, the, this incredible pillar of the Christian faith. It started at several different massive Christian organizations. And this big man is sitting behind this huge desk. And he said, I asked him the question that I asked every Christian leader, the very first question. And he goes, I asked that same question to Dr. Bright. He said, Dr. Bright, what does Jesus mean to you? And the author writes, he said, in that moment, Dr. Bright just looked at him. And the tears started to stream down his face. And he didn't say a word. The tears just kept coming. You could see the lump in his throat. And I've read that story many times. I've told that story several times. And every time I get goosebumps. Because that's what I want my story to be. I want my story to be of hearing and responding to the voice of God. So that at some point in my life, just at the name of Jesus, when someone says, what does Jesus mean to you? That we've had such a track record of him in my life and following after him and pursuing him and listening to him and responding in obedience to him. That the love in my heart wells up so much that it just keeps going up until it just floods out. Wouldn't that be a great epithet? How did this person live their life? They just heard and responded to Jesus. That's success. What if our church was known as a church where people just, just desperately wanted to hear from God and when he spoke, they obeyed? Wow! Holy cow, that would be incredible. As we, I was reflecting on this series back in July, this is my story, this song kept coming back to me and we're going to end with that song today. It's an old, it's, it, it, I'm not going to say old because that offends, that might, it's a song that has a few years on it. It's called Blessed Assurance. Song goes like this, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And then it goes into the chorus, this is my story. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. I told you every time we gather, we're going to give you a chance to respond. I just think, that I, I, when it, I have such a weight every time I open and preach because I feel like we have to respond. We have to do something with this. And so we have communion stations up front. We're going to even add more in the coming weeks. But I'm going to give you an opportunity to receive communion. Remember and celebrate what God, God has done. We serve an open communion here. It'll be a member, a regular tender. The only requirement is to be a follower of Jesus, and I'll give you that chance. You can light a candle. We have candles. That candle representing someone that, you need, that needs Jesus. So you're going to be bold. You're going to, he's nudging you, maybe. You can sing, sing, and just respond in that way. You can pray, kneel where you are. I don't care if people dance. I don't care if people stand on their chairs. I don't keep, if you want to lay on the ground and pray, I don't care. I really don't. It's your time. It's your time with the Father. Giving is the way we celebrate provision. But we're going to give you that chance. The band's going to come up when I pray. We're going to sing that song. And you respond. Come receive communion. Receive it as a couple. Receive it as a family. Light a candle for someone that you desperately want to see God intersect with. Pray where you are. Pray as a couple. Pray as an individual. But what if this was your mantra? This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Let's pray. Come Holy Spirit. Come fill this place. I pray that if, if there's anyone here or watching us online that has never said yes to you, that today would be the day that they would confess their sin. Today would be the day that they would turn. Today would be the day that they ask for a new mind and a new heart. Today would be the day that they say, I want to be a new creation in Christ. I want the old gone and I want the new to come. Today would be the day that they just surrender all to you. Today would be the day. God, I pray throughout this place, throughout all the spaces that people are gathering right now, that they would hear your voice, that you would nudge them, that you would remind them, you would speak to them whatever they need to hear. 
And then we would have the courage and the boldness to respond in obedience. This is our story. This is our song. Praising our Savior all the day long. Would you stand with me and respond?